Uh, hey, guys, tonight we are wrapping up our series, Portraits of Jesus. This is what we've been walking through, the Gospel of John, the last six weeks or so, unpacking all the I Am statements of Jesus. And if you guys can take a quick look up here, you can see where we've been over the last several weeks, where we talked about I Am the Bread of Life. We talked then about how, how God is, or how Jesus is not just our, our bread of life. When we think in fast food terms, we're talking like sustainer, the one who gives us the source of life. We kind of moved from there to the, where we had the, the light of the world, okay, where we talked about how the light expels the darkness, it exposes the darkness. And it brings things into focus. We talked a little bit about how I am the gate, the good shepherd, where Jesus said, I'm your protection and I'm your direction. We spent some time talking about how I am the resurrection and the life, that, that Jesus has power over death and life. And then we spent some time this last week talking about I am the way, the truth, and the life, where there's emphatic exclusivity in Jesus, where he says, I'm the only way, I'm the only truth, I'm the only life. And tonight we're going to be talking about the last of the seven, I am the true vine. And before we move on, I got to do something, and I might get in trouble for it, but the lady who has made all of these is with us tonight. Her name is Marley, and she's right back here. Can we show her some love, okay? She has made all of these things. Like I said, uh, we, didn't, we didn't go to Hobby Lobby and pick these things up. Uh, all of these are crafted by her and her ideas. And so what we want to do tonight is jump in on this. And basically what we've been spending this time doing is acknowledging that like, we want to be the ones that recognize Jesus for who Jesus says that Jesus is. We don't want to be the one that misses Jesus. We don't want to be the one that misunderstands all who Jesus is because we're so caught up in what the world has to say. And so tonight we're wrapping up this series. But I tell you what, in the next couple of weeks, we're kind of wrapping up this semester. Um, we've got next week, like they were just talking about, we've, we've got the experiment next week. And you don't want to miss the experiment. The experiment is simply this. It's an exercise in living generously. What we will do in our groups this next week, whether you collect an offering in your group or not, you, you can just go and serve. But I'm telling you, every time we do this, it's amazing. Because what happens is everyone in this space goes out into our community. And we don't just r do random acts of kindness. We do intentional acts of of kindness, of serving. And it is a beautiful thing to see a bunch of college-age young adults filling up people's gas tank simply because you were present. It's a beautiful thing to see people taking care packages to new families that have just had their child in the maternity ward. It's a beautiful thing to see people serving police officers, paramedics, all kinds of different things. You're going to see a family and, and serve them. Maybe it's buying them groceries, all kinds of different things. Going to restaurants and serving uh, people by picking up their tab and writing encouragement notes. It's an incredible, incredible thing. So we don't want to miss that. But the next week, the next week is lift. And like what they were talking about, it's our night of worship. That is where we will be saying, hey, let's wrap this thing up together and let's wrap it up the right way. We'll spend the night in prayer and worship celebrating what God has done over this last semester. But it's also our window to kind of invite as our guests, the seniors, because the hope is, is that they will join us and spend time with us this summer. But it's also the window where we won't be saying goodbye, but more so a see you later to some of the folks here in the return family who will be taking their next steps on to where God is leading them. And so it's a beautiful night, and you don't want to miss that. We're wrapping a lot of stuff up. Then we're going to take a break. Some of us are going to Romania. And then we'll get back, get back at it, right? All right, so you're like, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm going to Romania. And you're like, I need to get that figured out and start packing. No, um, <laughs> What I'm getting at is tonight's special. Tonight's special. This is the last night that we'll be in our groups in this way, unpacking this stuff before we go out and live it, okay? And so as we wrap all this stuff, I just want to kind of do a quick recap of like the heart and the hope in which we started this whole series. Because as we wrap it up, I'm telling you right now, I'm praying the same prayer and hoping the same things that we started with six weeks ago. And it's the same thing that, that the, the gospel writer John wrote in chapter 20, verse 31, where he says that he's writing these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that you would believe that he is the Son of God, and that by believing, you would have life. That's the heartbeat. That has been the prayer. That has been the hope. And so there's kind of these categories of us. Maybe we come in here with different stories, because that's my guess. Every single one of us comes in here with a different story, a different background. And some of us have been journeying with us for a long time. Some of us are like, this is my first time. I don't know who you guys are. I'm looking for the exit right now, right? Like some of us are like, we've been with us for maybe just a few weeks. But here's where I want to go with this. It's the same place we've been saying the whole time. And that's this, that if, if you're with us and you've never, ever 
place your faith in Jesus, if you've never claimed him as the one who saves you and the one that you choose to follow, the one that you look to, not just to make things better, but to make you whole, if you've never accepted the grace that so freely is given to you, I just, I want you to hear me. I am so thankful that you are with us. And I am so glad that you can be in this space and know that you belong even if you don't believe. And I hope that that is forever our heartbeat. But my hope remains the same. That you would begin to see him as who he says he is. The Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing in him that you would have life in him. You don't have to have everything figured out. You don't have to have everything figured out and understand everything, but it begins with belief. And I believe that Jesus not only invites us to believe, but he gives us all kinds of reasons to believe. But for many of us, we've been following Jesus for a long time, or we've been following him for a while, and we've been on this journey with him, taking steps of faith all along the way. But here's maybe what happens sometimes. Maybe what's happened is we know Jesus in one of these ways, or maybe two of these ways, but we don't know him in all of these ways. And maybe what's happened is we've said, okay, I'm going to believe you that you are, you are the bread of life and you'll be the one who sustains me for a season. You'll be the one that gives me the reset button so I can go back to taking, taking point. Or sometimes we'll be like, I don't know if I want to love you and, and believe you as the light of the world because what does light do? It doesn't just expel the darkness it exposes everything, right? And so proximity to light shows us where we're going. It's hard to get anywhere in the dark, right? And sometimes we don't want to get so close to the light of the world because he brings things into focus that don't belong in our lives. And so we don't really want him to be that sometimes. But some, sometimes for some of us, we look at him and, and we, we've allowed our priorities or our passions, all of our pursuits in life to be the, the volume to be so loud that we drowned out the voice of the good shepherd saying, here, follow me. And what happens is all of our pursuits and our passions, all these priorities in our lives, they're just prodding us along, pushing us in a direction that we don't know how to get to where we want to go because we're not listening anymore. Or maybe we will say, I want to believe that you are the resurrection and the life but there's stuff in me that's dead and I don't know if I can trust you with it. And some of us, we've been living like, you know, hey, you're, you, I hear you as the, the way, the truth, and the life. And I hear you say that no one comes to the Father except, except through you. But I've maybe been living like you're a way instead of the way. And so my hope is the same whether you've been following Jesus for a long time or you've yet to choose him. My hope is the same that you would see him as Messiah, that you would see him as Son of God, and you wouldn't just embrace pieces of him, you would embrace all of him. And so that as we look ahead of where we're going with all this, that your choice would maybe be to choose him for the first time or the choice to choose all of him all the time. That makes sense? And so that is the heartbeat behind this whole thing as we take a look tonight as this, at this final I am statement where we take a look at what, what Jesus has to say with his disciples before everything in the whole gospel wraps up. And so what we're going to do, let me frame this for, for a second here. Last week we saw this distinct shift. Jesus had been in public ministry settings and last week we saw him switch gears and move into a private ministry setting where he's only with his core disciples in the upper room. All right, And he's been walking through some heavy stuff. And when he went through this, all of this exclusivity, all of this heavy talk of this is the way it works, what he's been doing is just continuing that conversation. And in this little bit in between last week and this week, he's been rattling off more promises. He's promised that the Holy Spirit is coming, that, you now, that, our, that we as disciples, them in the room, these first followers of Jesus, that, that the Holy Spirit has promised them this advocate that will remind them of the truth that they've been taught. That the advocate, the Holy Spirit, would not only remind them of the truth they've been taught, but to guide them in, in their decisions. And he says this phrase over and over again. If you love me, you'll obey me. And if you don't, you won't. I find myself telling my kids that sometimes, or thinking that, like, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you don't, you won't. Because we equate the two. Because Jesus equates the two. 
But all of these things that he's unpacking, now they're on the move. They're not sitting around the table anymore. They're on their move. They're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. You know how we know that? Any ideas? It says so. Yeah, good answer. (laughs) Exactly. He just says so. Jesus says, come, let's be going. I wasn't trying to trick you guys. It's just pretty straightforward. That's what he said. Let's be going. So think of it this is everything that we're going to talk about. You're like, you're like, that's weird. No, it's not. They're moving. All right. So it's kind of like this walking, talking kind of dialogue that happens next as Jesus is teaching. And so here's where we find our last I am statement. Let me read this to us real quick. In the first handful of verses in chapter 15, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches." Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. All right. So Jesus, again, he's walking and talking and most likely with his disciples. Sometimes there's there's a lot of different views on this, but more than likely he's walking by the, the gateway to the temple, to Herod's temple. And on that gateway, the pillars around it would be, it would be adorned with this beautiful gold vine. All right? And more than likely, what is happening is Jesus is giving this little lesson in horticulture. All right? He's walking, he's talking, he's talking about gardening. And he's unpacking like some deep truth by attaching ideas to something that they would be very, very familiar with. This practice of gardening and cultivating and caretaking, but specifically the vine. Because in this passage, this passage, that is going to be what makes the whole thing make sense. Okay, and, and probably for many of us, whether you've grown up in church or not, you've probably heard this passage preached a gazillion times. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just encourage you to do this. Always approach God's word with fresh eyes and an expectant heart. Always approach God's word with fresh eyes and an expectant heart because he intends to show you something new. Okay, you could hear this preached a million times and there will be something more for you to learn. It's that rich. Okay. So once again, Jesus in these words, he's bringing this language of exclusivity. He's bringing this this language that sharpens their definition and understanding of who he is. As the same way he's been doing all along with all of the I am statements. And once again, he's making a claim here, a very bold claim. One that, that is more than him just being a guy who loves gardening, okay? That's not what he's going after here. He's using language that communicates this oneness with the Father, this relationship that's unique. He's claiming deity once again because every time they hear this, they're they're familiar with the Old Testament imagery, the phrasing of I am who I am. So every time he says that, they're hearing Old Testament language from Yahweh God, okay? But when they're walking by this vine on this gateway, what they're hearing is all the imagery in the Old Testament that is referring to Israel as being the vine. But here's the thing, in all of the passages in the Old Testament, when it's talking about Israel being the vine, it's always falling short. This vine is never sufficient. This vine is always, always lacking. And in the same way that Jesus talks about being the true bread and the true light, Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. I'm not lacking at all in any way. He's true. He's genuine. He's not counterfeit. The, the language here, literally, I love this. The, around, the, the richness of this word true, it literally means the original in which all other vines are a copy. I love that. It's, it's that he is the one and only original. You know what that tells me? Jesus is the OG. <laughs> like literally, like it, it is like how beautiful. It's like he's the original of the originals. Everything that you think is original, all those, think about all the ideas that you're like, I came up with that. No, you didn't, right? Like he is saying everything else, everything else is a copy of this, that he is the original. And it's the same emphatic, exclusive language as the only way, the only truth, the only life, all of it. He's the one and only. 
And so I think we got to grab a hold of this. Relationship to him is what matters most. He's definitely making it clear that what everyone thought, that through Israel, through the law, through all of keeping the law, this is the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's saying, what matters most is relationship to me. And that is true for us today. Relationship to him is what matters most, that he is the vine and the father is the gardener. Again, this relationship. But as we can see, we're the branches. Disciples are the branches. And when I think about gardening or anything with plants, all I know is I can't breathe here. I'm allergic to everything here. All right, some of you, anyone? Yeah, right? Here's what I know how to do. Mow. That's about the extent of my gardening. I grew up working in a garden. Doesn't mean I know what to do with any of it. I know how to mow, okay? Some of you are like, I don't even know how to do that. Emery does. He needs some, <laughs> some jobs, right? Some of you are laughing because you're like, he doesn't know how to mow. Um, <laughs> um, you know what? Here's the thing, though. I'm not a master gardener, but I learned this a couple years ago. My neighbor is. Like, literally, she has a degree in it. She is a master gardener. I don't even know what that does or what that means, but that's her title. I'm not joking. She has an education, and her title is master gardener. She's also Barbara, okay? She's my neighbor. And it's funny because in this, these beautiful days that we've had this last week, guess what she did? She went out and pruned everything, everything living in her yard, whether it was a tree or a bush or a plant or a squirrel or whatever, like, I'm just making sure you're listening. I'm just making sure you're listening. But she's just cutting everything down. And this huge pile of all of this dead stuff is out in the front yard. And it's funny because, like, she knows what to do with this. I, on the other hand, you know what I did? I went and I rounded up all of the limbs that had fallen from my tree. You know why? So I could do what I know how to do. Mow. Okay. <laughs> And here she is, she's masterful, and she's picking out things that don't belong. And I think what I'm, what I'm learning is this, that when you look at these words, immediately we see that a relationship with Christ, it's a living relationship. It's an ongoing relationship. It's an active relationship. Our union with Christ is a living union. And with that union comes pruning and cutting away. And really, there's just two kinds of branches. Ones that bear fruit and ones that don't. And one thing I've learned from talking with neighbor, master gardener, Barbara, is about rose bushes. Because we got some rose bushes and I don't know what to do with them. But here's what I've learned. Rose bushes need a ton of pruning. A ton of pruning. They need constant care and upkeep. And here's the reason why. Because of the way a rose bush grows, it has a tendency to get tangled up. Okay? Now think about what Jesus just said. He says that he's the vine, the father is the gardener, and you are the branches. And have that in your head as I tell you about rose bushes, okay? Here's the way rose bushes grow. They get all tangled up, so much so that they grow inward on top of themselves. And here's what happens. They get so tangled and grow so inward that they block the sunlight to the rest of the rose bush, working against itself. And so if there's not someone there to carefully prune and cut away not only what the, what the rose bush has already had die, but the branches, the, the everything, all of this, if, if, if someone's not pruning this, it will just keep growing in on top of itself. And the roses will be fewer and smaller and buried, and you won't even see them. And I'm fascinated by that because it feels so familiar. It can't even grow in the right direction and to the right ends. Pruning is necessary. It's necessary or you'll have a rose bush with no roses. you just be a tangled mess growing in on top of yourself. And here's what I think we can learn in this. The purpose of pruning is to stop wasting energy and being unproductive. The purpose, the point of pruning is to stop wasting energy and being unproductive. You prune the rose to help it be its true self. 
This isn't talking about potential. It's to get the clutter away so that the roses can bloom. It's to, it's pruning is to maximize its fruitfulness. But sometimes when we think of pruning, our minds go straight to like, it feels like punishment, right? Because we feel like we're just getting cut up here. Sometimes it feels like the dude wielding the knife doesn't know what he's doing because everything hurts. Sometimes we feel like we don't trust him with the knife. Maybe it's because we're so grown in on top of ourselves that we are blocking out all that needs to be able to come in so that the roses can actually bloom. But so much of the time, pruning will feel like punishment to us if we see it through the wrong lens, and it's because it's painful. And when you, when you think about it, there are things in our lives we know that we've invested so much time and energy in, right? Think about some of the things that you have spent your life chasing. And it all got taken away and you were so mad about it. Because that belonged to you. But maybe, just maybe, God had something better for you because he wanted something new to bloom in your life. And he knew that if all your energy was going after something that would soon kill itself and drive you into the ground, he knew the only way to free you of it was to prune it from you. We can't look at pruning as punishment. We have to look at it as purposeful. He doesn't just cut away the dead. He cuts away living tissue. Things that are still growing but maybe not growing in the right direction and in the right way because if it's not pointing back to him, it's not growing where he wants it. It's all for the purpose of increasing the quality of the fruit in our lives that we bear. God wants quality and he wants quantity. And I don't mean mass production. What I'm saying is he intends the best for you. And Jesus in this passage, he wants his disciples to make this connection because if you look at verse 3, where it says, it says that you have already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by this message I've given you. The word there is actually cleansed. And so he wants his disciples to make this connection between pruning and purity. And he's saying right here in this, you've already, you've already been pruned for this. You've already been groomed for this. You've already been purified for this. I've given you a message. And he's saying you already know this. So remain in me, abide in me, stay put in me. Because apart from me, you can't do anything. It means this, you can't do jack squat. Nothing. You will be able to accomplish nothing of value apart from him. And here's what it keeps screaming at me. Jesus is making it clear that Jesus is absolutely necessary. Jesus is not just a good idea. Jesus is not just a way to live. Jesus is saying I'm necessary. I'm absolutely necessary. That's why he can use words just a few verses later. I'm the only way, the only truth, the only life that no one comes to the Father except through me. Remember the, the emphatic exclusivity, this unambiguous uniqueness about him. And now he's saying, if you're going to choose me as the only way, this is what the way looks like if you're going to live it. It is going to be pruning and fruit and more pruning and more fruit, and more pruning, and much fruit. There's a pattern. And when we choose to follow the only way, this is what a relationship with Jesus looks like. Pruning and bearing fruit. He's absolutely necessary because apart from him, there's no pursuit worth pursuing. There's no, there's no passion that is worth going after. There's no game worth chasing. There's nothing, nothing, that we can do that will amount to anything. But man, we love to chase after things. And we love to grow in all different directions. And we get so tangled up. And we feel punished when what God is doing is loving us well. He's saying, this is what it looks like to do life with me. And so maybe the question that we can ask ourselves is this. How is God pruning you? How is he pruning you? Like, what maybe are you being groomed for? Because some of you, you probably got a hunch. 
because you've recognized some of the patterns. You've taken the time to investigate the patterns that you're in. But some of you right now, you just feel stuck and you feel punished and you feel like he's cutting you to pieces and you don't understand why. Matthew 7, Jesus is talking and he's talking about truth. True fruit and trees and good fruit and bad fruit. And he says this, a healthy tree produces good fruit and an unhealthy tree produces bad fruit. That's pretty straightforward, right? A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. He says, yes, the way to identify a tree or a person is by the kind of fruit that is produced. Good fruit, bad fruit. What kind of fruit is your life producing? What kind of fruit do people see when they see you? What kind of words do you use? What kind of persona do you portray? What story does your life tell? What, what does the fruit in your life look like? Because Jesus is saying you can't produce your own fruit without me. He's saying you have to stay connected to me. You have to stay connected. He is the vine. We are the branches. And he goes on to say this in the following verses. He says in verse 6 and following, he says, Anyone who parts from me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, you may ask any request you like and it will be granted. My true disciples produce much fruit. This brings great glory to my Father. Here's what we can learn. Branches are good for bearing or burning, but not building. Branches are meant to bear fruit, but if they don't, they will be burned. But you can't build anything of any value as a branch disconnected from the vine. We must stay connected to the vine. We must grab a hold of that because we draw life from the vine. We cannot produce our own fruit. And it paints this image of this deep communion, this deep relationship that's ongoing and it needs to be cultivated. And I know you guys are probably sick and tired of hearing me tell stories about my wife and my family, but I tell you, I can't help but think of the fact that 20 years ago, Crystal and I established a relationship. We were friends. And then with came dating in the progressive tense, this treacherous territory between single and married, right? We talked about this earlier in the year, right? This process of evaluation that we move through, not this status that we arrive at. But come June, 17 years ago, we established a covenant a marriage. I'm married to the most remarkable woman I know. She's the best thing about me. And I've learned this all along the way. If we're going to be healthy, it requires, it demands, it deserves daily devotion. A relationship can be established. But if we do not find ourselves daily devoted, daily choosing to cling to that relationship... We won't be healthy and we won't bear healthy fruit. And just like the sheep hear their shepherd, I mean, think about it, in a flock, the sheep and their shepherd, if they want protection, if they want provision, what do they have to do? They have to follow. There has to be action. They have to keep taking steps with the shepherd. So here's the deal. When we realize we are the branches, we realize just how much we need Jesus. And I want, you to, I want you to grab a hold of this if you miss anything else tonight. You will never stop needing Jesus. And you will never start needing him less. You're never going to stop needing Jesus. And you're never going to just be weaned off of him and be like, I don't need you as much now. No, you will forever, always, absolutely, completely need Jesus. That's what he's saying. Always. So, how do we remain? How do we abide? 
How do we, these words that John uses literally 11 times in these verses, 11 times, he's trying to make a point. What does it look like to abide? What does it look like to remain? And I want to make a couple points about how we remain. And the first is this. I think we remain to be people of prayer and worship. If you want to remain connected, if you want to remain in right relationship, if you want to abide, then you remain people of prayer and worship. But here's the other piece. You remain connected to community that knows Jesus, that loves Jesus, and celebrates Jesus. Because I'm telling you right now, what we have here, this is special. But sometimes we don't appreciate how special it is until we have stepped out of it. And we miss the people in our life that know us and we know them. Remain people of prayer and worship and remain connected to community that celebrates and knows and loves Jesus. That's what happens when we remain, that his life can work in and through us to bear fruit. But here, here's what it looks like to remain, to abide, to stay connected. And there's a few points I want to make with this. And the first one is this. What does it look like? I think it looks like effective prayer. Because in verse 7, he says, you can make any request. If you, if you join your life with me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you want. And it'll be granted. And some of us were like, sweet, I would like. And then you rattle off your list. McNuggets, a car that doesn't catch on fire. Um, anybody else? You know, some of you are like, no, I'm just stuck on nuggets, right? Like we rattle off all these things with our prayers. And, and here's what I, I, I want us to grab a hold of in this. When we are in him and he is in us, we want what he wants. And so we ask for what he wants. When we're committed to his word, when we're committed to his will, our prayers are effective and fruitful. And they will always display God's glory. And sometimes we're like, well, God didn't answer my prayer. Well, maybe he did. He just said no. Or maybe he said not now. Sometimes we just think because what we want we read that and we miss, we miss that our prayers should be aligned to what he wants. Here's the second thing. Not just effective prayer, but I think perpetual fruit. Well, this is what it looks like to abide. Perpetual fruit. In verse 8, he says that my true disciples, that they will produce much fruit. So you move from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And he says true vine, true disciples. He's making a connection that there is truth here and there are counterfeits. And you will be able to tell by the fruit that is, that is in someone's life. And he wants tons of fruit. Tons of fruit. That when we're connected to Christ, that's what comes. But here's the thing about fruit. And maybe you've thought about this before. But I think a lot of times we miss it. Fruit is for everybody else. Like, think about it. Branches don't eat the fruit. Think about that. You ever seen an apple tree? eat apples? <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't think I have. <laughs> Some of you are though still trying to think, maybe, like maybe I have, like you're racking your brain. No, like here's the thing. This is why the experiment matters so much. This is why next week matters so much because what is going to be unleashed is a whole mess of people going into our community, loving people in ways that they're not expecting. You know why? Because that is fruit in your life. This is why serve day matters so much. This is why the way you connect beyond what we have right here matters so much because fruit is us serving others with our words and our works. Fruit is us serving others with our words and our work. And all the fruit grows out of abiding, out of remaining. But you know what else it looks like? to remain, to abide, a deepening love and mind-blowing joy. A deepening love and mind-blowing joy. Here's what he says as we, as we continue in the next few verses before we wrap this up. He says in verse 9, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey me, 
You remain in my love just as I obey my Father and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I command you to love each other in the same way that I love you. Filled with love, filled with joy, overflowing with love, overflowing with joy. And it's all tied to obedience. Abiding is not just remaining. Abiding is obeying. <clears throat> so what fruit is your life producing? What evidence <clears throat> is there that you are abiding? Because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And if you don't, you won't. Can people see that Jesus is the true vine when they see you? Because I think, I think our lives can be visibly moral. I think we can go to church on Wednesdays and we can go to church on the weekends and we can be active in ministry and we can serve places and we can, we can read our Bible a lot and we can pray a lot, have all the, the right Bible answers. And those are all good, good things. But they don't necessarily reflect abiding. They don't necessarily reflect that because our proof of fruit in our life, it comes in the form of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Because when the Holy Spirit lives in us, that's what life looks like. And it's one fruit. It's not a bunch of fruits. It doesn't mean that you can choose to be patient and not be kind. It means that when we get the Holy Spirit, we get all of this. And that is the fruit we are called to bear. It's the fruit that people can taste and see that God is good so so what do people see when they see you? Or maybe the question is this, is that the fruit you want in your life? Because I'm telling you, I don't, I don't believe there's any other way apart from him than to be connected to and stay connected to the true vine. Jesus is absolutely necessary and choosing him changes everything. And it will lead to pruning. And it will be painful. Trust me. It will be painful. And it will hurt. But he will never be nearer to you than when he's pruning you. He will never be closer to you than when he has a knife in his hands. <laughs> Makes me think of C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. And they're running around. And they're talking about Aslan. And they're like, he's a lion. I don't know if I want to go meet a lion. And they're like, doesn't that sound dangerous? And the beaver says, he's like, he goes, whoever said that he was safe, but he's good. He's good. Not choosing him comes at a much higher cost. What you believe does not determine what is true about Jesus. Truth belongs to him. Your choice doesn't change you. It, it, it it, your choice doesn't change him, it, it changes you. And I think as we look at this and we wrap this up, I want you to think of it this way. Is he the bread of life in your life? Is he the resurrection in the life? The gate, the good shepherd, the true vine, the way, the truth, the life, the light. Whether it is choosing him for the first time or choosing all of him, all the time. My prayer is that that is your choice. That if you've not ever chosen him, that you would say, maybe, you know what? I do believe this. So what now? And we get to have those conversations. And I'm telling you, I'm ready to have that conversation. But if you have already claimed him as Christ, Savior and King, my prayer is that this, just as you accepted him as Jesus, the Lord of your life, that you would continue to live in obedience, that you would root yourself deep into him and you would draw up nourishment from him and that through that your faith would grow strong and vigorous because of the truth that you've been taught. And you know what happens next? Fruit. Your life will overflow with thanksgiving. And wouldn't it be amazing if all people ever met of you 
was that kind of fruit. Let me pray. Father, uh, thank you for your word and thank you for tonight and thank you for everyone that is here. God, we want, we just, I just want out of the way. We want this to totally, completely belong to you. But we want to see lives changed and lives made whole that our lives point people to you. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.